great. Let me share my slides. Okay, everybody see that? Yeah, it looks great. Great. Well, great. Thanks for the introduction. I'm so excited that you invited us here. Uh, we love to get the message out and what a better day to do it than stop waste food waste day. Love it. Um, and it definitely ties in to um, the mission and drive of plant-based Utah. So we're excited for this partnership. So um, this is uh, some of us at the United Nations and Chandler did a great job of introducing our organization organization. We're really dedicated to the education, prevention, and diversion of food waste in Utah. So to get started, when we, we talk about food and food insecurity, it's just interesting to, to show the just, just the position of the two. So, you know, in Utah, there is 400,000 people that go hungry every day. And at the same time, we're wasting 600,000 tons of food every year. And if you do the math on that, that's actually enough food to feed those 400,000 people three meals a day for 18 months. It just doesn't make sense. Um, as one person once said, um, hunger is not a supply problem, it's a distribution problem. How do we get the surplus food here that's not needed and get it to those in need? And that is why we exist. And in, to go a little bit deeper into the, the food waste problem, this pizza, let's say, you know, you're, you're at a, the pie pizzeria and probably wouldn't have pepperoni on any of you, but, <laughs> um, and the, the waiter is bringing out your pizza. You can smell it. You see the steam coming off of it. And before the pizza gets to your table, they stop at the trash can and dump off a third of that pizza into the trash. You'd be, you'd be like, wait a minute. I just, I bought that pizza. I wanted that pizza. Well, that's the amount of food waste that's going to waste in the, the world is a third of all food that's produced and raised never even ends up at our fork because of this problem. That's enormous, especially when you think of the planet and the population growing, it just does not make sense that we're doing that with food. If we bring it down, down to the household level, Say you've gone to the grocery store, you've got these five bags of groceries, the clerk says they'll help you out to your car with that. You load in three of the bags, go to put in the other two, and the clerk starts to walk away with your two bags of groceries. And you say, wait a minute, I just bought that. Well, that's actually what we're doing at home, just not when it's brand new fresh food, but we are doing it. For example, when this bread gets stale, we're throwing it away this red pepper that we may not have gotten to, it's in the back of the drawer, or these grapes that weren't quite sweet enough, we throw it away. Um, the good news is in 2019, that number went from 40% of the food we bring, bring home ending up in the trash to 35%. So it's an improvement, we'll take it. But even that, you just, you think, why would we do that when we spent our hard earned money on this food? And you think of all it, it took to grow this. Uh, for example, the average household, that amount of food that's being wasted amounts to $1,600. So again, when we think about being efficient with our money, another reason that we don't want to do that. And 37% of all the food waste that happens in the world is happening on the consumer level. So the good news is it's something each one of us can make a difference and improve, which I'll go into um, in a minute. So just to give you perspective, this lettuce, um, just if you'll, let me open chat. I want to, if you guys uh, will just, oh, I don't think I see chat. There, sorry. Okay, um, if you guys will put answers in here for how long you think it would take this lettuce to decompose in the landfill. Any guesses to just throw them out there? Great, three months, thanks, Lindsay. A month, it's Anna, hundreds of years. Nancy, you're fairly close. Katrina, too. 25 years. And for me, when I first learned this, I was just like shocked because I always would thought, hey, food ending up in the landfill, it, it biodegrades, right? So that's better than plastic, right? 
Well, it's actually not. And the reason that is, if you think about the process, right? A dump truck comes to landfill, backs in, dumps the food or you know, dumps whatever, everything we waste, right? They come and compact it down, more dump trucks come, dump more waste, compact it down. And what that is, causes is no oxygen being able to get in there. And that's what food needs to decompose. So what's happening then is microbes come in, eat at that, let off methane gas. And that actually, that methane gas is actually worse for the environment than the carbon dioxide from our cars. And the reason that is, is methane gas actually traps heat in the environment more than carbon dioxide. So that's why it's more dangerous. And thinking about then compost, like why is that such a less time? Because that's actually more like the two weeks to a month, depending on how you turn it, um, is because you're putting food in there, you're also putting um, uh, leaves probably and grass clippings, you turn it regularly. And that process is what actually allows it to decompose the way it should. And the oxygen is allowing that to get in that you're not having those microbes, methane gases and being let off. And that's why it can decompose so much quicker in the compost bin. So something to think about now when you throw that food away in your bin. So back to uh, global food waste, just to show the enormity of this. If, if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world, just behind China and US. So that blows my mind when you think about how many countries there are in this world. And it also just dis disappoints me to see that the US is number two on that list in terms of waste of food. And you know, you can stop and kind of think, right, we, our grocery stores are always full of food. We, we don't see scarcity, whereas there are many countries, right, when they maybe make the long walk to the grocery store and have to carry food back, or there's not always food on the shelves when they get there, they are more conscious of that food and making sure it lasts. And so some of it is that overabundance that we've been privileged to be exposed to in the US that, that leads to that. But the pandemic showed some of us that there can be shortages, right? We saw it with toilet paper, we saw it with meat industry because so many people were getting sick in meat processing plants. Um, so something to think about. And not only, you know, that food when it goes to landfill is letting off methane gas, but you think about the wasted water, right? So a pound of bananas, if that were to get wasted, that's like taking a 42 minute shower. That's how much water went in to growing those, that one pound of bananas. And another reason to support plant-based diets is a pound of beef is like taking a 370 minute shower. And if you figure the average shower is eight minutes, that's 46 showers. Like, wow, that is amazing. And you know, it's so much water goes into raising beef, which a lot of you know, because you're fans of plant-based. And so it's another reason to support the plant-based diet. Um, and if you do eat meat to just be more aware and conscious of trying not to waste those things. And also, right, there's transportation that went into it. So you think of the carbon dioxide that the trucks did let off to transport that. Um, the soil, we're depleting the nutrients in soil because we're just growing so much and, and then to have a third of it being thrown away is crazy. So enough of the bad news. I want to get to the good news. I'm an eternal optimist. And so if you guys would throw out in your chat what you think any of the top five are, and you don't, you can number them if you want, or just, hey, I think one of these on the right is in the list of five. Throw that out in the chat. No particular order, just any that you think. Rooftop solar. Thank you, Anna. Okay. You're being shy. So we'll I'll I'll show you the answers. Plant-based, yep, geothermal, rooftop, and turbines. Those are good ones. Okay, let me show you. First one's refrigeration. So this is the chemicals that go into refrigeration, right? The, the HCFCs is what they used to be. Those were banned because they were putting a hole in the ozone layer. 
but even the alternative, the HFCs, um, aren't that great. And you think about it when we ban things, they still tend to be in circulation. And so that is actually the number one solution to reverse global warming. And I should mention, this comes from the drawdown study. So this is where 200 scientists came together to look at all the existing solutions that are out there and say, which are the best? That if we really implemented these full scale, we can actually reverse global warming. So refrigeration is number one. Number two would be wind turbines, which was in one of your guesses. So that was a good job. Uh, the, the book actually has onshore and offshore listed separately. Uh, so in this case, wind turbines onshore is number two. And ta-da, food waste is number three. Um, this study came out in 2019. So it was after we started our organization and it just was so inspiring to me because I just thought, oh my gosh, this is something we all can do, right? We can't all go put wind turbines in our backyards, but we can all make small changes with our food waste. So super excited about that one. I also want to show four and five because this is interesting as well. Four is plant-rich diet, which I saw a couple of you mention. And five is tropical forests, which is related to food as well. And so uh, in 2020, the drawdown group did more in-depth research and actually you know, looked at these three since they're all diet related, food related. And if you combine those, it then becomes the number one solution to fight global warming. That's amazing. That's something all of us can make a difference on in, in reversing global warming. So that's the good news in this, is this is something we can all do something about and make things better on our planet. So let's talk about some of those solutions. What are those to help reduce food waste? And I'll start first with, with what each of you can do, each of us can do, and then also share what Wasteless Solutions is doing. So one of the first things is the sell-by dates, best-by dates, use-by dates. Those, if you go to the USDA website, and search this, they will tell you that this only signifies quality, not safety. And yet, when I typically do this presentation in person, I ask how many live and die by the sell by dates, and it's about 50 50. Half will say they live and die by them. So think about that. Now, if you didn't know it before that the dates just signify quality and not safety, we suggest doing the smell and taste test, right? You know when milk is bad. So smell it, something, a small taste of something is not going to make you sick. So if the smells like, oh, maybe small taste test, right? If it doesn't taste right, you're gonna know it. And that is going to be a huge um, thing that will reduce food waste. That's one of the top items that causes food waste is us going by these dates, not just in our homes, but stores, right? As soon as they get to those dates, they're either, some cases, giving it away in many cases, throwing the highly perishable items away. And if you think about eating out, the, the infographic on your left is shocking, in my opinion, when you think that since the 1950s, our dinner, our restaurant meal has um, grown in size four times. Like, why, right? Why do we need this much food? We don't, right? You're seeing obesity numbers. Um, you're seeing a um, lot more waste because of it. You think of the you know, muffins at Costco they sell, those are huge, um, things like that. So it just doesn't make sense. And when we have that, it means we're wasting more. When you go out, you see how much they're serving us and people just, in many cases, it's more than they can eat. So 17% of those meals are uneaten because of that size. And of that, 55% of those leftovers, people aren't taking home. And those that do take it home, 38% are not getting eaten. So they're putting it in the back of their fridge and forgetting about it. So a couple of suggestions is, you know, share, right? If you know the restaurant is typically large portions, share with people um, or definitely take it home and plan a leftover night in your weekly schedule that, to make sure that you eat that. Um, I have a neighbor that we, I live downtown. And so they always make a point of taking the leftovers and when they leave the restaurant. They just walk by the way home and give it to someone uh, who's homeless and they know it's been eaten rather than gone in the trash. 
Another suggestion is to buy what you need. You know, we're all tempted by offers and two for one, or like in this case, this lettuce on the left is from a big box store, like a Costco or Sam's, and it looks like such a great deal, right? The price compared to what you get at the store. But if you're not gonna be able to get to those six romaine hearts, it wasn't worth it, right? It goes to waste, you've wasted your money. So really buying only what you need and that can include, you know, we have bulk stores. And if you're familiar with Hello Bulk, you can take your own containers. And not only are you not getting plastic that way, but you're also just getting what you need. You're buying, you know, this much nuts rather than, you know, a five pound bag of nuts that may go bad. Um, so we always suggest that. And, and don't go for those offers of like buy two for one, those types of things, unless it's not perishable, then, then sure. And you know, you're going to get to it, but if it's perishable, we encourage you not to, to do those unless you're sure you can eat them because it's really not a deal. And another suggestion is shopping from your fridge and pantry first. So if you're one that, that goes shopping on a regular basis and plans your week, that's going to be the best way to reduce your food waste is planning and creating a menu and saying, here's what we're going to eat and be realistic, right? Not say, hey, I'm going to cook dinner seven nights this week, plan for, um, I particularly only plan for four, knowing I'm going to have leftovers, maybe order out to help a small business, and who knows what happens. So I, that's how I plan it. So let's talk about that lettuce we saw earlier. Today we've got iceberg lettuce in our fridge that we don't want to go bad. This is how you can shop. And the other thing I suggest about this is this is helpful when sometimes you're overwhelmed with what to eat during the week, right? Like, oh my gosh, I have to think of what I'm going to want. Is starting this way with what you have in your fridge and pantry that needs to be used, it makes it so much easier. You just go in and say, oh, look, I have purple cabbage. I have lettuce. What can I make this week? And Pinterest is something I do. I've sometimes put in like two random ingredients just to see if there was something I could make with the two. And I have. So that's always a great one if you're not sure of ideas. But starting from the fridge and pantry. So you've got this lettuce. Say Sunday night, you're like, I'm going to make some tacos. I'm going to put lettuce in those tacos, but that's not going to use all, all my lettuce, right? So then maybe Monday, I'm making lettuce wraps um, and using, you know, these are um, meat. But what if you said, hey, I've got carrots and cucumbers and cabbage making lettuce, vegetable lettuce wraps is a great one. Um, and we also encourage people to use homemade sauces. So buying ingredients rather than sauces, because you may end up with hundreds of those in your fridge that you don't need. Whereas if you make your own, you can just make the amount for that meal. And say, I still have some lettuce left over, right? If you're a smaller family, the whole head might go this far and you say, okay, Tuesday, I'm gonna make a lettuce wedge salad. And so you're having that variety because a lot of people don't love the same thing all week. This is a way to incorporate that through. So rather than buying lettuce for tacos and not using it again the rest of the week, think, rethink that. Like how else can I use that in a different way that sounds appealing to myself and my family? So I want to talk to you a minute about what we do, ways of solutions to also help address this issue. First and foremost, we do things like this, education. That is our biggest thing. Um, and I want to show that here is this is this is called the food recovery heartbeat. And it's kind of hard to tell here, but it, the can narrows. So the idea is most preferred at the top when you have your food. OK, how can I reduce the amount of food I have? First and foremost is number one that we should be doing. Second, then after that, if, after we've reduced, if we still have some leftover, we want to give to hungry people. Then if you still have some leftover that say wasn't edible or just didn't get eaten or the date uh, was passed, feeding animals with that. Then industrial uh, uses. For example, in Utah, we're lucky enough to have Wasatch Resource Recovery, which is uh, turns food into um, natural gas. So that's kind of exciting. So that would be number four. Five is composting. So a lot of people get excited when they hear what we do and they say, oh, I compost. And I say, that's great. It's second from the bottom, right? So before ending up in the landfill, compost what you can. It's absolutely fabulous. We need it. We need to be doing all of these. But we have chosen to focus on the top two. We want to teach people how to reduce their waste. And then we also want to feed people with our food rescue program. 
Um, and one call out for those of you on the compost, in case you're not sure, I like to just tell people in Salt Lake, right? If your green waste bins that you put your leaves and your grass clippings, you can put produce, you can put eggshells, you can put uh, coffee grounds in those uh, so they can get composted. So if you're not composting at home, that's a great way to feel like you're contributing to the good and not sending your food to the landfill. One of the other programs we have is a restaurant certification. So some of the small restaurants don't have a lot of food waste. They do tend to have a little bit more in the, the once it gets on people's um, tables. And so we're working with them to develop measurement programs and then see how we can help them reduce their waste, uh, their food waste. But also we see this as a great opportunity to educate consumers. Like if each restaurant that signs up is communicating to customers about food waste and why they've made certain changes on the, the menu or putting a little flyer with the to-go box or a little sticker on the to-go box that talks about food waste and gives them tips to heat up their food. We can make a greater impact rather than just us doing it. So that's why we launched this program. And our biggest one is a second on that hierarchy that we mentioned is food rescue. We call it like Uber for food waste. When there's organizations like caterers, cafeterias, restaurants, food distributors, grocery stores, farmers markets, and even backyard gardens, we are able to collect that food by having the donors sign up in our app to say they want to donate. And we, our goal for this is really to have every food organization in the United States, or sorry, in Utah, should be the United States, but we're concerned with Utah, sign up for this, uh, even if they only have, have extra once a year, right? A snowstorm happens and they can't open. Like we want them to know we're here and that we're there to pick up that food. We have volunteers then that sign up and they look in the app, it tells them where to pick it up, who to ask for, what time. They load up their own car and take that immediately to one of our receiving partners, which is a nonprofit that can use that feed to that food to feed the food insecure. For example, we have YWCA, which uses the food to make meals for the women and children staying in the shelter. And then we give some food to like Boys and Girls Club, where they actually let families take that food home so that they have food at home at night and weekends. And we've been doing this since we started in 2018. And to date, we've saved almost 500,000 pounds of food. And that's been through 1,400 food rescues. And the amazing thing is that's only with 56 food donors. And if you think of how many food organizations there are in this state, we have so much more we could be doing. And the beauty with this app is we have the ability to grow because it's all automated. I always like to show some of the food that we rescue because I, I think some people think, oh, you know, dumpster diving. It's not, we get food sometimes that I say, what's wrong with this, I can't tell. And these bananas, for example, right? This little brown spot you can see, but you don't see much elsewhere. Well, grocery stores want their produce um, green, their bananas, and so they will reject entire truckloads if, if they don't see that. And so we rescue a lot of bananas. And in my opinion, I still like them browner than that. So those aren't even ripe enough for me yet. The strawberries, these are about three or four days out from really starting to get a little moldy. So they do need to be eaten quick. And that's why the customer rejected these. Uh, the, we pick up from cafeterias. Those before the pandemic were our biggest donors was cafeterias and caterers. And so on the left was from the University of Utah from an event that the cafeteria hosted and we rescue all of that leftover. And on the right, when you think of cafeterias have a lot of the grab and go items and they only keep them on the shelf three days and the health department says they're really good till day seven. So we're getting fresh food on day three or four. And these go great to our senior citizen centers where a lot of seniors are food insecure. They go in for a hot lunch and then can take home some of this food and have it at home. I mentioned we pick up from farmers markets and backyard gardens. Well, these two pictures are both from the farmers market in downtown last summer. And these eggs, the farmer says, you know, I advertise farm fresh. So when they're at like day three or four, I just don't feel like I can call them farm fresh. 
And so he gave those all of those eggs away, which was, uh, I just thought, wow, to me, that's really still very fresh. And peaches, we learned something at the, the farmer's market that after each produce season has kind of been going, it gets to this point that people kind of get sick of that. And then they see the next produce coming into ripening and they want that. And so at the end of each fruit season, we tend to get a lot of it. Like people are just like, I'm tired of peaches. So you can tell these first two bins are perfect, right? You see this one's a little bruised. Well, we take these, last summer we took them to Catholic community services and they make hot meals for the homeless and they can use the ripened ones for um, all sorts of different things. They put them in salads, whatnot, and then the overripe, they'll make jam. They make use of all these items. And so I'm just gonna end here and say, how can you help us? Uh, following us on social media is a great way, as Chandler knows, right? It, it's helpful in getting the message out. Also, when you're asking for grants, they love to know what your reach is. And if you're interested, the app, foodrescue.us, uh, when you go there, there's a sign up now button and you can sign up to become a rescuer. And if that doesn't work, you can, the other thing we always love help with is finding new food donors. So if you know somebody who works at a restaurant or your favorite restaurant or favorite food store, going to our website, we have a contact us page. You can just send us the note. Hey, I know Jim at um, um, Trio, contact him about food rescue, right? That's also a great way to help us as well. So I will stop there. And uh, we're going to do questions after Jessica. So I'll turn it over to Jessica. Thank you so much, Dana. Such important information as always. And it's always amazing to me that you are able to address food insecurity at the same time as food waste. I think that is incredible. So thank you for your work. And yes, we will turn it over to Jessica. Okay, thank you so much. Hopefully everyone can see me. I'm standing in my kitchen. I'm doing a hands-on demo today without slides. Um, but that information, Dana, was so awesome. And I sort of live by one of my favorite quotes by Maya Angelou, which reads, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. And this quote certainly pertains to me personally on my own food waste journey. Um, as Chandler mentioned, when she read my bio, I am a registered dietitian. I've also been following a whole food plant-based diet for over 25 years. But the concept of food waste and, and the problem that it's causing is relatively new to me. And unfortunately, most of my background has been in nutrition science. But I truly believe when we talk about nutrition science, that it's very important to understand the entire food landscape, because that's how we get nutrition is through food. So when we talk about the food landscape, we're talking about food policy, agricultural principles, how our food is grown, consumer access and food security, like Dana mentioned, and definitely food waste. So I certainly learned some pointers today, and I'm going to talk about some of the things I've incorporated in my own life to help reduce my personal food waste. So Dana mentioned the um, composting pounds, the green waste vents through the Salt Lake City Sustainability. And I do have a little um, countertop composter that makes it super easy to use that can. I used to have my own backyard composter, but it was hard for me to manage the amount of compost I produced following a whole food plant-based diet. So this has been a great solution and they turn it into compost at the landfill, which is awesome. So excited for the, the city to offer that. It's something we all should be um, utilizing. And then, and again, kind of following my quote, one of the things I like to do is just constantly evaluate how I can do better in my own life. So I picked doing a demonstration on plant-based milks because this is one area I identified where I could definitely do better. So um, again, following a whole food plant-based diet for 25 years, uh, way back in the late 80s and 90s, there weren't many great choices for plant-based milk. In fact, there was powdered soy milk and the aseptic package soy milk that sort of tasted like chalk. It, it wasn't all that great. And flash forward to where we are now, and there's entire grocery store shelves filled with commercial plant-based milks. Most people see this as progress towards the direction of the plant-based movement. However, if we step back and really subscribe to the idea that we should be eating more whole foods from plants and less foods from factory plants, this sort of misses that idea. So the great thing about making your own plant-based milks is it not only eliminates all of this bulky packaging that ends up in the landfill, 
but you also get to control all the ingredients that you put into the plant-based milk. And then most importantly, you get to control what comes out of it or the waste. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. I'm gonna to demonstrate two different techniques and then a recipe utilizing the pulp from the nut milk we're going to make. So I keep all of my items in bulk. You can shop at bulk food stores such um, in bulk bins. Uh, and there's a couple stores that locally that actually sell specifically bulk items. So I have an assortment, so I never run out. I can make different plant-based milks at any time from almond milk, cashews, even hemp milk, flax milk. And these are whole oat growths. So it's important when you're making your own oat milk that you use the whole oat growths, not the rolled oats. Um, so today I'm going to demonstrate one of my favorites, which is just a really simple almond date milk. And all you need is raw almonds, about a half of a cup. And we'll also send out a recipe sheet with these recipes as well. So I have a half of a cup of raw almonds mixed with two to three pitted medjool dates. And again, I buy my, um, my, bulk, my dates in bulk and just keep them in a jar. And you want to pit those and then you just soak it overnight. And then it's super easy. Once you have these soaked, you can drain off the water. And the first technique I'm going to demonstrate is using something that most people have on hand, which is a high speed blender. So this is my Vitamix. And when making almond milk, one thing that I've learned is to use pretty hot water versus when you make oat milk, these are my oat groups that have been soaked, is to use ice water. If you use hot water or even room temperature water with the oat groats, it gets a little gummy because of the fiber in those. So um, the milk can get a bit, the consistency can be bad. So here's my drained almonds and dates. Now I like to add a little flaxseed. I don't even really measure it. I just sprinkle a little in here to get the health benefits from the flax. So this is ground flaxseed meal. One or two tablespoons is great. It also um, helps to thicken the almond milk. Um, place it on the Vitamix, and then I have some water that I heated up. So again, with the almond milk, you want to use a relatively hot water. This is actually almost boiling. And then I just pour it to about the five cup line. So again, only one half cup of almonds to five cups of water, and then. Just turn your blender on. And you can just run your blender until the almonds are processed fully. And to do this technique, you not only need your blender, but you also need a large glass jar and either a cheese cloth or a nut milk bag. These nut milk bags you can buy at local grocery stores, which is natural grocers. Um, and I just fit mine over the glass jar with a rubber band to secure it. And it's very easy. However, you do have to extract the, the pulp from the nut milk bag at the end, which I'll show you. So um, you just pour the milk into the jar. And we'll just slowly let that work its way down as we move on to our next technique. And I did this method for years and it's great. It's, it's very easy. It's, it's low impact to the kitchen. You don't need to have additional supplies. However, this past year when I really made a full commitment to make all of my own homemade plant-based milks, I did invest in a nut milk maker. And I just want to point out that I don't receive any compensation or any endorsements from this manufacturer. However, this is the one that I own. It's called the Almond Cow. And the interesting thing about this contraption is it comes with the, the base where you collect your milk. And then instead of using a nut milk bag, like I just demonstrated, it has a container that collects all of the pulp in here. So in this demonstration, I am going to make a coconut cashew milk. And this doesn't take very much coconut. So I only like to use a little bit of dried flakes. I've also made this using the fresh coconut meal from a coconut and that works well too. So for this recipe, you need about three fourths cups of raw cashew pieces and then about an eighth of a cup of dried coconut flakes 
or the fresh coconut meat. And again, the very first step is to drain off the soaking water. So these I soaked. The, the cashew and um, coconut milk, you only need to soak for about 12 hours. And then you place this into the basket. And one thing that I, with this milk, with the coconut cashew milk, is I don't add any additional sweetener because the coconut already has a little bit of a sweet taste. So you don't need to, to add any additional sweetener. And then you place in this particular nut milk maker, there's the blades on here. So you just place the blades into this basket and make sure it's sealed nice and tight. And then you place it into the base with your water. And in this case, I'm also adding five cups of water. And this, this can just be room temperature water. It doesn't need to be as hot as the almond milk. You place this in here. The little green light comes on and you just press the button. This runs for three cycles, so we just have to go through two more cycles. <laughs> So that's the last cycle. I was going to unplug it in case the blades want to turn on on me. And what you'll see here is when you pull the top off, we have all of the pulp contained in the filter basket. I'm just going to set this aside in a little collection cup. And I'll pour the milk into the glass jar for storage. It's a little frothy at first, which is great, which if you do like to have froth milk in your morning hot beverage, such as coffee or tea, this makes a nice frothy milk. I have a friend and I that are um, in the middle of a frothy challenge to see if you can get the best froth on their plant-based milk. But you can see this is a beautiful plant-based milk um, made out of cashews and coconut. And this is great. It's really creamy. It, it, this works really nicely for cream-based soups. But we're going to show you how to use the, the remaining pulp from the basket. So I also have my almond pulp over here, which I can utilize for making granola. I can actually throw it into smoothies. I know people who just eat it as like a breakfast cereal topped with berries. That's over here in the bag. And then the coconut cashew milk. I, I have right here. And I'm not going to worry too much about draining the additional milk off of there. You can let it set. You can kind of push it through with a rubber spatula. But since I'm going to be putting this into a soup, I'm going to leave, leave it a little milky. I'm going to set that aside for right now. And I'm going to show you how to make a curried spring carrot soup made with the um, nut milk pulp. So you should all get this recipe. Um, Chadwell will send it out. One of the reasons why I picked this recipe is again, eating locally and in season is another thing you can do to have an environmental impact. So right now with the spring temperatures, we have lots of carrots popping up in local gardens. Um, so these are an in-season vegetable as are some of our spring onions. So this soup only calls for six ingredients. It's super simple. The carrots are packed with carotenoids for health as well as um, turmeric in the curry spice, which is an anti-inflammatory spice. And then it's zero waste because you're using the pulp instead of what this soup would traditionally call for is a can of coconut milk. So we know that that's processed, it's high in fat, it's been sitting in a can for a long time and you have the packaging that comes with the can. So we're gonna start out um, with this. I do use my Instant Pot, but you can certainly put the carrots on just your traditional stove top. So I start out with my Instant Pot container. And in here, I'm going to add four to five large carrots um, that are just chopped. These only need to be chopped into about an inch or two chunks because you're going to puree them at the end. So there's the carrots. 
one half of a sweet spring onion. And then I put my ginger in here to, to really cook to add flavor. So this is about a one inch piece of fresh ginger that I just peeled and cut into chunks. Now, the great thing about this is you're going to cover it with a vegetable broth. And to make this truly zero waste, what you can do is you can repurpose any of the scraps from when you peeled the carrots. So these carrot tops and things like that, parsley, um, parts of onions that you're not using as the edible parts, you can actually store that in your freezer and then make a, um, a batch of fresh vegetable broth. So this is zero waste vegetable broth. This is two cups of vegetable broth. And then in here, I just have my onions, my carrots, and my vegetable broth, and my ginger. And I'm going to pop this in the instant pot for about five to six minutes and let it cool on its own. So voila, it truly is instant. <laughs> um, so I, I pre-cooked this batch to show you so we didn't have to wait for the time. The instant pot isn't quite that instant. Um, but this is just the cooked carrots and onions and ginger mixture with the zero waste broth. Um, and then the carrots are tender to the to a fork, so we know it's ready to go. So then what you do is you just take your blender carafe. And you pour this mixture into the blender. Some of the broth in case I don't need it as soupy because I'm going to be adding that mixture of pulp. So then in the blender, we now have the carrot, onion, and broth mixture right here. And then we're just going to add the rest of the ingredients. So the rest of the ingredients are the um, curry powder. So this is a half tablespoon of curry powder. And then we are going to use this lovely um, pulp. And you can imagine in making commercial nut milks how much of this pulp is wasted. So I'm just going to dump this all in here. Now, what you're not getting when you buy plant-based milk is you're not getting all the fiber that comes from the pulp. So this is not only adding the creaminess, but it's also adding some fiber. I'm going to put the lid on. consistency of it. This is nice and thick, which I like it nice and thick. I often serve this over um, a little bit of quinoa or brown rice and have a little more of the broth that we have. Make sure we get all of that utilized. I'll just give it one last pulse. Make sure the lid's fully secured before you can your budget. Um, we'll set that aside, and then this soup, uh, you can just pour it into a bowl. I actually really like to sneak a little lime juice in here, and I also like to top it with some fresh topped parsley or cilantro, which I'm often looking for recipes to add cilantro because I'll buy a bunch of cilantro and then I don't use it all. So this is some um, fresh topped cilantro. And then I have a little lime juice, which I'm just going to squeeze on top. It really mellows out the curry flavor. So you can just squeeze the lime right on top there. And then you have this lovely curried carrot soup made with the cashew coconut milk. And there you go. And we can come back and visit the almond milk. What you can see in here is if we loosen up the bag, in this technique, you have to really milk out the bag. That's a little messy, so I won't demonstrate that today, but it's, it's also very easy. And then you just end up with your pulp in the bag. So again, the pulp, if you're not going to use it immediately like I did today, you can put it in some silicone freezer bags and store it in your freezer. You can also dehydrate it into a flour to be used in muffins and pancakes or cookies or whatnot. So 
that's my demonstration today. Now we'll um, hop over and answer some questions. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was great. I wish I was at your house to enjoy that soup with you for lunch. Um, one thing that Jessica said that I love, I keep a Tupperware in my freezer. So as you have food scraps, a lot of times recipes will call for just like a few onions, green onions, and I'll let a few kind of get, you know, close to going bad. So I'll hurry and freeze them or onion scraps. Um, another good thing too, if you buy herbs for a recipe and you have extra, um, you can just pop them in the freezer if you feel like you're not going to use them and then use those for your stock as well. Um, okay, let's check out the chat. Does anyone have any questions that they either want to throw in the chat or you can, this is a small enough group, you can unmute yourself. We did have one about Dana, are you willing to share your slides? I will be posting this video online so we can get them that way, but. Yes, happy to share. Love people to know those facts. Thank you. Perfect. Brett. So I'll have Dana send those over to me and then I will send those out. Um, I had a question for you, Dana, what sort of policy changes um, would you like to see in an ideal world? Like what are kind of the policies around the food waste issue that would move the needle? Yeah, and, and it's a good question because it, interestingly enough, there are cities across the United States that have implemented them over the last few years. And so I've been watching those to just see what are, <clears throat> what are the ones making the biggest difference. Um, for example, France a few years ago put in one that supermarkets couldn't throw away food, they had to donate it, but there wasn't a lot of um, stringent um, policing, policing of that, right? And so, um, you know, begs the question of, well, is at least build awareness, but should we have that? So that's a question for me is like, what's the right way to do it? But I would love to see just let's start with restaurants, grocery stores of, hey, mandating that we have to get rid of it, whether it's you know, if it's inedible composting, right? That's an easy one to get going with and just saying it's required. It's not an option to not send, to, to send food waste to the landfill from those types of businesses. I would love to see on the home front that we all have bins for food because if you, um, you know, with us who has the anaerobic digester here, it could even get so much to the point that if we could, right, handle it, you could have food waste bins because right now you can put in produce, um, eggshells, coffee grounds into your garden one. But if we had food waste bins that went to the anaerobic digester, you can put in oils, you can put in bones, um, all sorts of stuff. Um, they even, anaerobic digester is, even takes from like Coca-Cola manufacturer like old bottles of Coke. I mean, that stuff is being made into fuel. And so th those are probably the biggest ones. I'd love to see legislation around, start there and then and see where to go from there. Yeah, I love that. I am gonna be sharing this later this week on our social media, but I went out to tour the digester um, a couple of weeks ago and they have just like uh, pallets of drinks from Starbucks, tons of oat milk, which is a, such a shame. <laughs> Makes me want to start doing what Jessica does and make it yourself. But I mean, it, we're so lucky to have it because there are only like a handful of the digesters in the country, correct? That's correct. Yeah, so we're very lucky. So I'd like to see it fully utilized. Okay, some of these questions in the chat. Does Wasteless Solutions service all of Utah or just Salt Lake County? Uh, good question. So we are in Salt Lake County and Utah County now. So we do have our food rescue in both. And um, our goal is to be in all of the metropolitan areas, but uh, giving being a nonprofit that we're taking it by this at a time. But we are in the, both of those counties now. Great. Let's see. Um, Lindsay asks, I actually don't know the answer to this one. Maybe Jessica or Dana, you could shed some light. But if you freeze herbs, are they only good for stocks or can you rehydrate them. Anyone know on that? You know, I, from my own experience, I think the freezing will often change the texture. So it's not going to be as easy to use for like fresh foods and things like that, like for the top of a soup or in a salad, but you could certainly use them in soups or, you know, particularly like basil. There's a lot of recipes out there for even pureeing it and making little cubes in advance that you can use to put on um, pastas and things like that. Um, but, you, but you definitely could incorporate them into recipes. Great. And, and one tip kind of bef 
before it gets to that point, but thank you for answering that, Jessica, because I was like not being a dietitian chef, I don't really know. But um, one of the things too, is just before, like, so when you get it, like Chandler, you showed that plastic container, they typically come in and there's two kind of families of herbs. You've got the more hardy, so like a thyme or rosemary where the stem is not edible, right? You're picking things up. Those type of items, if you wrap them in a wet paper towel and then store them in an airtight container, you'll get weeks more of life. And then if they're a uh, more gentle stem like basil or um, parsley, celery, just cut off a little bit on the bottom of the stem like you do with when you bring home fresh flowers to let the water come up through the stem, then put them in a glass of water and put it on your counter. You don't even have to refrigerate them. And again, you can get weeks out of them. Whereas if you leave basil in that plastic container, you're gonna see it start to get black and moldy within probably seven days or less. Right. Yeah, and both basil and rosemary make such great house plants, right? Where you don't even need to worry about the waste because you can just take some things off as you need it. That's a great one. I, I usually do that with a basil plant and, you know, they sell them at the grocery store for like $2.99, whereas that little plastic is like two, $2.50 maybe. So yeah, great absolutely, one. absolutely. One thing John, I was going to mention, um, but I wanted to leave time for Q and A, is the idea of some of like the misfit markets and the imperfect foods. Um, that's one thing I started doing this year was just ordering the misfit markets produce box, and they, I get a box of produce. It's sort of like the rescue produce. Um, but any thoughts if anyone else has tried it or uh, any other ideas? I mean, I really, really liked it. Um, in the summer, I often do a community supported agriculture. So I'm not, I'm not sure if I'll continue with that in the summer where I can get a lot of things local. But Misfits Market is all organic produce. Um, and it's often produce that they wouldn't sell in the store. And then it just comes nicely packaged in a box. You can pre-select too. So you don't have to worry about some of my friends that I've tried to encourage to do this. They've been worried about getting produce items that they wouldn't utilize, but you actually get 48 hours before a notification and you can pre-select the items that you would like to get in your box. And I have been really impressed with the quality of the produce I've received in my Misfits box. And it's one of those things I feel good about not only, you know, one of the things I often run to the grocery store for is fresh produce. So it's actually eliminated one of those weekly trips to the grocery store, and anytime I can eliminate a, a trip to a market, you know, I cut down on food waste, as, as you were pointing out, Dana. So I really like it for that, but then I also like the idea of rescuing this produce. Yeah, such a great solution, especially in the winter. I would like to encourage everyone to shop locally. I think getting your food directly from your farmer when you can, which we can right now in the in the harvest season um, is a great way to go. So let's see, Lindsay AY asked, um, are there ways I can personally rescue food for myself too? One thing that I will say before turning it over to Dana and Jessica, um, we have partnered with the Village Cooperative on a few backyard farms in Rose Park this year. And if you are in the area, um, the way that their program works is they sell a third of their harvest um, through their CSA program at market price. And then a third of their harvest is given away to anyone that comes to volunteer. Um, so if you would like to come and volunteer, I can certainly send you more information about that. And then a third, they give away to neighbors who, um, low income neighbors um, that need free produce. So it's a great program um, and would be happy to share more info about that. But I don't know, Dana, if you have any other thoughts? I've seen, you know, in documentaries, people that dumpster dive. I know that is a solution. <laughs> I don't know that you can guarantee, you know, what you're going to get, but. Yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, one, we're trying to um, start to promote it more. It's another app, right? It's nothing we have. It's out of um, Denmark originally, and it's called Olio. So it's O-L-I-O. -O. And I have seen some people start to use it in Salt Lake. We do need more people using it to make it work. But the idea is, say for example, um, you know, one of you mentioned you have a ton of basil. You can actually post on there a food item and say, hey, I, anybody want this? And someone will say yes. And you can like, you don't even have to meet them, right? You can say, hey, I'll leave it in the mailbox, um, come get it. And so it's swapping with people food. I've seen people post half pizzas on there things like that, but that's a fun one to just, you know, you have to be a little adventurous, kind of like the dumpster diving, uh, but that's an option as well as I have just heard that um, Too Good To Go, another app that has come out of the UK, 
might be here. I heard it was, but I haven't gone and checked to confirm. So caveat that. Um, and that is where restaurants can actually end of day, if they have food left over, put it on the app and it's kind of a mystery bag. You don't know, but if you know it's a restaurant you like, hey, you're going to get it. And the restaurant sells it at steep discount. And so they're making some money off of it at least. Um, and it's getting to people that uh, will enjoy it. So those are the two that I've, I'm aware about. Um, quick comment, and then I'm going to turn to Nancy's question, but to Lindsay EY um, asking if they take food scraps anywhere in Utah County. Um, Abby at Animalia, she just opened a shop that she sells handmade goods. And because this service of taking these food scraps is only available to businesses, she thought, well, I'm a business and I could allow individuals to bring it to me and then get it to the digester. So I wonder if there's a way where you could approach if there's a business that seems particularly aligned to any of this stuff um, and ask them if they're interested in a program like that, because it would be, it's such a great service. Um, so Nancy asks, outside of education and mandating policy as a path to change, are there other ways that you're partnering with the private sector to affect change, Dana? We aren't at this point, um, you know, again, just being a nonprofit and, and trying to focus, we, we have so many things on the wall and we keep saying, okay, what are we going to get right first um, and move on? But um, we have lots of things we, we want to work on in the future, but that's where we're at today. Um, Lindsay, the name of the program is Food Rescue. And I had a question, Dana, do you ever, um, you said that you need more businesses willing to donate their food. Have you ever approached businesses or restaurants asking them for food donations and they say no? We do sometimes, right? Um, and and what we usually say is two things that they may not be aware of is first, you know, they're concerned of liability, but there is a national law called the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act that protects food donors. If they donate in good faith, and that typically that what good faith means is, hey, I, it's food that I would sell to a customer should be the same quality. So you're you're doing it in good faith. They can't be held liable if someone were to get sick. Um, and then the other thing locally is we work with the health departments and they're huge supporters of this, right? Because it is um, health of the community as Chandler was saying at the beginning of the whole food system. And so they're very supportive of food rescue. And it's funny because I actually feel like that is better ammunition with some because it's, I think because the government is, the federal government is a little bit further away, but the the health department can shut them down. So they're like, uh, oh, the health department's on board. Okay, great. So that's what we typically get. We'll still have a few that just aren't up for it. And, and you know, that's like anything. And so we say, great, we'll keep going to the next. And, and I believe, you know, as new technology comes out, you have those late adapters, the laggers, they call that we'll get them once enough people get on it. And they're like, okay, we'll get on it. But it, it's not the, that the majority that say that, but yes. Um, I just dropped it in the chat because I learned about this law in the documentary um, that everyone can watch if you want to. Uh, just eat it. It's public law 104-210. They show a scene where they're going up to these grocery um, grocery store employees asking for the donated food that they've taken off the shelves. And the guy's like, sorry, we can't. It's a liability. And so if you just write this law down, hit them with it, and then <laughs> hopefully they'll give it to you. So worth a try at least. Um, Anna had a question earlier, Dana, I would be curious, you know, what challenges in your own life, like what's, what type of food waste is hardest for you to eliminate? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for me, it's probably the scraps, right? Like, yes, I do. Like Jessica suggested the scraps in the freezer, it just made vegetable broth yesterday, but like lemon peels, lime peels, I'm a big citrus person. And like, I still haven't figured out, like, yes, if I'm having a drink that night or you can make cleaner, but I always have way more than I, um, than I can use. And that's what I notice in my trash is a big one. And, and again, you know, none of us are perfect. There are times that I'm like, I have this thing, I shop Sunday and I'm so excited by Saturday if my fridge is empty, like, yes, I was successful. And I, every once in a while, I'm like, oops, I didn't make it. Yeah. Um, but, but I use my freezer, right? As you mentioned, Chandler, that's a great one is I write dates on anything I put in my fridge. And so I check that a couple times a week. Go, oh, I'm not going to get to this one and move it. Just move it to the freezer is a great one. Um, and just by writing the dates I use, if it's a Tupperware, I just use like a dry erase marker, put the date on it. Um, but yeah. On that note, I had a question from someone who had to hop out early. Um, if the date on frozen food, 
Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know a lot of foods, you know, the date is actually just a sell by date, but if it's frozen and it's been in there, you know, I would say probably the same, same deal, right? Or I mean, is there yes. a point where you should be throwing your frozen food out? No, it's, it's really just going to be quality, right? So if you air seal it, right, it's going to last longer because really what's changing the flavor is those ice crystals. And so if there's air in there, you'll get the ice crystals and it will start changing the flavor, but there isn't, right? If you go to websites like foodsafety.gov, it's where you can get good information about food safety. Um, you know, they put dates like, oh, freezer or fridge, but um, I have not had any issues in, with freezer stuff. Um, it's frozen, right? It's not introducing. Right. It's not. A yeah. Right. The only thing I will say, you know, if you defrost, um, you know, defrost in the fridge, not the counter, because you can introduce foodborne illnesses that way. If you defrost in the fridge and don't get to it in time, you can put it back in the freezer and, and it won't have any impact on it. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, if you think of anything later that you would like to ask, I dropped my email in the chat. It's Chandler at plantbasedutah.org. Or if you have any ideas, you know, I always like to connect with people about this issue and I'm sure Dana does as well. You know, the more that we can get the education out there, cause it's just something that people don't know about. And, you know, I feel like if they did, it's so easy to change. There are so many opportunities to improve. And like Dana said, we are so lucky to have this digester. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, how can we get everyone, you know, at least directing their food that way? Um, as a good start. So thank you all for being here. Um, we'll send this out, the recording with the recipes. And I might try to collect, you know, a list of those apps that you mentioned, Dana, that could be fun for people. Yeah, so send that to you. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.